I know what you're thinking right now. Which malicious Slav composer had a stroke to write such horrible intro music? Don't worry, all of our composers are in perfect health. In fact, we don't have a composer. The music you just heard, if you can call it music, is definitely not pleasant. It sounds like the kind of thing a small child would make using the GarageBand app on their parents' iPad. But it's actually pretty cool. Back in the early 2000s, libertarian-leaning programmers around the world began a miniature artistic movement, all based on a software program. The idea was to use the source code of this particular program and turn it into various forms of artistic expression. T-shirts and ties with the code were manufactured and sold online. A high school student printed the code as the quote in his high school yearbook. Another group of friends created a video with the code scrawled on screen in the style of a Star Wars movie intro sequence. The song you just heard was part of this movement. A man named Jeff Schrepfer created it by, quote, removing all the white space in the code, then transforming each ASCII character into a single note of its MIDI equivalent, end quote. Essentially, he translated the text of the program into musical notes, which is why it sounds nonsensical. Later, Mike Castleman, another software engineer, created his own version of the song by incorporating all white space and new lines of the code into the length of the note. Here's a snippet from that work. It's kind of worse, isn't it? Like two people making love poorly on top of an untuned piano. Still, even if it's not pleasant to the ear, have you ever heard a computer program before? Have you ever even considered that that is possible? Schrepfer and Kesselman, like other members of the hacking community, were proving that you can hear, see, and experience source code in all kinds of ways, just like speech or ideas. After a year or two, people had come up with over 40 different ways of expressing that same source code in artistic form. But it wasn't all for fun. These people wanted to make a point and shove their point in the face of America's legal system. Because they had a lot on the line. A teenager facing years in jail, U.S. copyright law, and the future of free speech. Hi, I'm Ryan Levy. In this episode of Malicious Life, the story of DCSS, a battle of hackers versus Hollywood. On June 1st, 1999, Sean Fanning and Sean Parker released Napster the MP3 file-sharing platform that allowed people to send and download high-quality music from their favorite artists for free. For two years thereafter, the platform would wreak havoc on the music industry. As listeners saved their money, music acts, labels, and publishers saw their revenues plummet. Lawsuits were filed against Fanning and Parker. A cultural shift was in the making, the legacy of which would survive long past 2001. We have Napster to thank, in part, for the Spotify's and Pandora's of our world today. Those applications which allow us to listen to just about anything for a small fraction of what we'd have to pay if physical records were still the norm. Now, imagine being a movie executive as the Napster era was unfolding. You'd probably be shaking in your shoes. Piracy already existed in the film industry, but nothing along the lines of Napster. More often than not, bootleg movies were shot by people sitting in theaters, pointing their low-grade handheld cameras at the screen. Image and sound quality was low, disseminating large numbers of VHS tapes was a chore, and movie files in digital format were far larger and more cumbersome to disseminate than three-minute songs. So the movie industry had a leg up over their colleagues in music. But were these precautions enough? 
In the late 90s, the industry shifted in large part from VHS tapes to DVD technology. DVDs had longer lifespans than VHS tapes and allowed for greater sound and video quality. The shiny silver discs looked sleeker, took up less physical space on store shelves, and DVD players were relatively cheap to produce. At the same time, for all the added convenience they lent distributors and customers, DVDs also introduced new security concerns. Blank discs were cheap enough to buy, and with their speed and storage capacity, could prove a useful vehicle for copying large data files, like, say, a full movie. The format was new, so it was yet to be seen how pirates might make use of the DVD format. Still, studios were well aware that they would try. As a precaution against piracy, a new standard for DVD security was devised. It was called CSS, short for Content Scramble System. CSS worked kind of like a house key does. Most of the time, you keep your front door locked. Only you, anyone you live with, and maybe a trusted neighbor or friend hold the right kind of key capable of unlocking your door. The system ensures that nobody is able to enter your house without express permission. CSS worked by first scrambling the data stored on a DVD disc. Every verified manufacturer of a DVD player was given their own unique key capable of decrypting the CSS algorithm. So if you insert Shrek into your Sony DVD player, your player will unlock the movie with its stored key and then run it. Insert the same disc into an unverified player and nothing will happen. In addition to security, CSS also lent movie distributors power to dictate where, when, and how people could watch movies. For example, Shrek came to American movie theaters in May of 2001 and was released on DVD in November of the same year. It only premiered in Chinese movie theaters in January of 2002. Because American and Chinese DVD players held different keys, DreamWorks were able to sell DVDs in the winter of 2001 to American households without concern that they could be copied and played on Chinese DVD players, which would threaten in-theater revenue. Some took issue with this feature of CSS and how it prevented them from watching already widely available movies because of where they lived in the world. Others were frustrated that it failed to cooperate with Linux, an increasingly popular operating system for tech enthusiasts. Then there was a libertarian-leaning coalition within the hacker community for whom CSS ran antithetical to their deeply held ideological belief in total freedom of information. Before long, a few members of that community took it upon themselves to challenge Hollywood by breaking CSS. At age six... Jon Lecht Johansson began playing around with his father's computer. Per Johansson, a mild-mannered Norwegian postal worker who owned a business selling computers on the side, encouraged his son's emerging hobby. Quickly, the hobby developed into an obsession. At age seven, Jon's father bought him his own computer so that he could finally get his son to stop hogging his own. More than anything else... Jan took to the art of reverse engineering. He liked taking things apart and put them back together. At age 14, for example, his father bought him a digital camera. It was buggy, so Jan went in, analyzed its software, and rewrote it to work better. A few years later, he bought an MP3 player that kept crashing. After studying how it worked, he built a superior program for the device and posted it online so that others could download it for free. The company that manufactured that MP3 player then reached out to Jan, interested in hiring him for more formal work. Jan sent in his resume, but never heard back. Probably, he says, it had something to do with my age. He was 17 at the time. 
In his blog, Jan acknowledges learning from and writing to those programmers who came before him, reading articles, tutorials, and a textbook on microprocessors. And if he was a computer whiz, he sure looked the part too. Skinny, crew-cut, glasses, and paler than Norwegian snow. Jan was only 15 years old when he first posted DCSS online. It's why the story was so juicy when on January 24th of the following year, Norwegian police raided his home in a small town of southern Norway, seizing his phone, computer and CDs. Here was the mysterious DVD hacker, the man who battled Hollywood's biggest studios and puberty at the same time. International media outlets wrote of the criminal wunderkind and his program that could play back any movie. Norwegian newspapers cried out, here, look, things do happen in Norway. Jan Johansson became a celebrity. He got a nickname, DVD Jan. Faced with criminal charges, a campaign was started to, quote, free Jan. Just about everybody who heard about Jan Johansson got the same story. Of course, it was almost entirely false. Drink or Die, or DOD for short, was founded in 1993 by a hacker living in Moscow. By 1995, DOD was a global piracy enterprise with branches in the US, Europe, and Asia, made up of hobbyist hackers, university undergraduates, and working engineers who would leak proprietary software from the companies they worked for. They had a website and a slogan, Where's Bears from Russia and Beyond? Where's, with a Z, you should know, is a name for pirated material. DOD may have been one of the world's most significant piracy organizations in 1995, but by the end of 1996, they'd largely fallen off, responsible for only approximately 1% of the world's pirated material online by 1999. Still, remnants of the organization maintained. One of its remaining members went by the name D-Easy. D-Easy, a German hacker named The Nomad, and a UK software engineer named Derek Focus, all separately over the year of 1999, contributed towards the same goal of breaking CSS. On September 23, 1999, D-Easy's DOD Speed Reaper 1.0 program was published on the livid internet mailing list. Speed Reaper did decrypt CSS, but it was flawed. For example, it would not work for all Warner Brothers titles, as was discovered when it was tested on a DVD for The Matrix. Meanwhile, on September 11th, Jan Johansson had engaged a user named MDX over Livid's internet relay chat about how the CSS encryption protocol might be discovered by probing a poorly secured DVD player. Eleven days later, MDX informed Jan that a German hacker nicknamed the Nomad had already done just that. Remember how CSS works. Every DVD player's running software contains its own key capable of unscrambling the data on a DVD. In order to secure the system, those DVD players must encrypt their keys, lest someone like Nomad pick in and find its decryption algorithm. Well, it turns out a company called Zing Technologies had not encrypted their decryption key. Quote, we found that one of the companies had not encrypted their CSS decryption code, which made it very easy for us, Jon Johansson later told Wired magazine. We didn't think it would be that easy, in fact. With the Zing key in hand, these hackers were able to start building a program that could mimic an authorized DVD player and therefore run any DVD. The Easy was able to solve his Warner Brothers problem, and due to a quirk of piracy software networks, where typically new versions of programs are not allowed to be published before a period of two to three weeks has passed, the Easy handed the code to Nomad. 
also implemented in the new program was CSS authorization code from Derek Farkas, who previously worked on the problem of making DVDs watchable on Linux systems. CSS contains an authorization component in addition to its encryption component, the code for which had been leaked anonymously online earlier in 1999 and rewritten in the C programming language by Focus. Altogether, as a result of the work laid out by these three parties, DCSS was birthed. Jon Johansson wrote a graphical user interface for it and published it on Livid on October 6th. The source code leaked later that day. Johansson, MDX, and Nomad formed a group called More, Masters of Reverse Engineering. And then, a few weeks later, another breakthrough occurred. Reverse engineering the Zing DVD player to obtain its key was the discovery which allowed DCSS to be born. It turned out that as significant as finding that key was, equally important was finding out that it was only 5 bytes long. This was essentially a password short enough for a computer to guess. On October 27th, a Norwegian video game developer named Frank Stevenson created a livid account in order to post his brute force attack algorithm capable of decrypting CSS without any key. 170 more authorization keys would fall before the hackers figured that was enough and moved on. This meant that even if Hollywood removed the Zing decryption key from all future DVDs, their program would have a bank of other keys that would also work. If Hollywood removed every one of these 170 keys, the hackers had the tools to guess whatever new keys replaced them. On November 1st, 1999, Wired magazine broke the story to the wider world. Quote, the worst fear of movie studios has been realized, it's read. DVD movie encryption has been broken. Malicious Life is sponsored by Cyberism, an end-to-end cybersecurity solution built to empower defenders. So how does Cyberism empower defenders? Here's John Breen, head of global IT security and cyber operations at FlowServe. FlowServe is a global corporation in about 60 countries, um, nine business languages, about 20,000 employees. We make pumps, valves, and seals, and then uh, we do nuclear contracts, military contracts. Our intellectual property is extremely valuable. My entire security team has, our lives would be very different right now if it wasn't for cyber reason. I would not be sitting here talking to you. I would be sitting back at the office cranking through 15,000 machines to get them all restored or, or purchase new ones if we had to, depending on how bad it was. So Cyber Reason is watching the shop, watching the, the store while we're sleeping. And that's something that I would have to augment with staff without a platform as good as Cyber Reason. Before Cyber Reason was in our environment, we were playing a lot of whack-a-mole, so to speak, you know, trying to uh, run around and, and, and deal with things that we were understaffed, ill-equipped to handle, um, and this just really helped to fill um, the gap that we needed, not just with the managed service, but the actual solution itself is very uh, good at um, self-remediation, uh, sinkholing IPs and traffic that shouldn't be, um, because it's an indicator of compromise, for example, and that's just one task that myself and my team wouldn't don't have to do anymore. We had in the past many challenges around lateral movement of, of, of malops and with cyber reason in place that just doesn't exist anymore and it's really really good at protecting uh, from those types of threats whether it's ransomware or any other type of malop, CNC, elevation, privilege elevation. Um, I, I think that uh, the visibility gets us and the um, comprehensive understanding of what the threat is and how it's moving, as well as the ability to do queries and, and, and see kind of threat patterns, how, they're, how they might be evolving or how they might have come in, um, hooking into um, uh, threat exchanges for um, hashes that are constantly coming out, uh, indicators of compromise that are constantly coming out, all put in the back end of Cyber Reason um, without us having to load it. I mean, this is fantastic. Yeah. We love Cyber Reason.
My name is Andy Patrizio. I'm a freelance journalist who broke the story on DCSS back in 1999 for Wired News. I had a friend in uh, law enforcement at the MPAA, and back then, DVD-ROM drives were very rare and very expensive. I had one because I was a reviewer. And so she knew this, and she sent me an email saying, hey, these guys are claiming they can remove uh, DVD copy protection. Can you ch check it out for me, please? And so I had a, you know, I was a DVD owner at the time, and so I ran the program. It was, um, it was, it was called DCSS, um, and it it worked perfectly. And I sent her an email back saying, uh, yeah, it works. You better find a, a DVD ROM drive for me to test it out on, and I'll come up and give you a demo. I lived in Marina del Rey at the time. The MPAA is in Encino. For those of you who don't know the lay of the land in Los Angeles. That's about a 30-mile drive over the mountains. It's not a fun drive. But I went up the next day, and the CTO of the MPAA was there with a laptop that had a DVD-ROM drive in it. And I popped in a DVD, and I ran it, the DCSS program, and showed them. Now, DVD-ROMs could be read, and you could see the files, the VOB files, but you couldn't run them. You couldn't copy them onto a hard drive and run them because they were encrypted. What I did was I ran the DCSS program and then ejected the DVD from the DVD drive and I showed them. You know, here it is. Here's the disk. Oh, and, and I showed them the movie running off the hard drive. I said, this thing works. Soon after demonstrating DCSS to the CDO of the Motion Picture Association of America, Andy went online in search for someone who could tell him more about it. He didn't have to venture far. Unlike the Easy, Nomad, and MDX, Jon Johansson personally published DCSS online and used his real name in doing so. He welcomed the attention. And I didn't think that the MPAA could reach out and you know, try to strangle a 15-year-old kid from Norway. I, if I had known, I never would have put his real name in. Um, but he f was fairly insistent on it. I met him on IRC. That's where we talked because the link that was sent to me for DCSS had, you know, contact info. And he said, hey, you can find me on this server and this channel. And that's exactly where I found him. And I told him who I was. I was never surreptitious. I said, up front, I'm, you know, I'm a journalist with Wired News. Would you like to talk? He said, sure. After the first article broke, it was picked up by other news outlets, rewritten, twisted, and before long, the teenager responsible for writing a GUI was now being referred to as the man who cracked CSS. Or rather, the boy. In a statement published on November 4th, 1999, Jon Johansson wrote the following, quote, I never told the media that I had cracked the DVD encryption. What I told them was that we, more, had made up an app called DCSS, which would decrypt DVD movies and let them be played off your HD or off DVD-Rs if you have a DVD burner. I always used we and more when talking to them. I never said anything about me or my position in the group. Now that the storm is over, I see that all they were after was to get a big story. They even included some of, quote-unquote, my quotes, which I never said. When media starts making up stuff, it's really sad, end quote. You may find it unsurprising that, facing jail time, Jan might try to absolve himself of any crimes. In reality, his statement was published long before he faced criminal charges. His denial was merely one part of a longer post titled, the Truth About DVD CSS Cracking by Moore and DEZ slash DOD, co-authored by DEZ and Nomad, who, despite remaining anonymous, seemed to want their due credit. You can sense their jealousy elsewhere in the post, like when they wrote, quote, Lately, Jon Johansson of Moore has been pretty much all over the news in Norway, though he had nothing to do with the actual cracking of the DVD CSS protection. Yes, it was Moore who did DCSS, but the actual crack was not a team effort. Moore didn't even exist back when the anonymous German, who is now a Moore member, cracked it. Most of the papers chose a headline very similar to this, quote, 15-year-old Norwegian cracked the DVD code, end quote. They probably did this because they wanted to make a big Norwegian woohoo out of it, end quote. 
in public, rather than back away from his potential criminal liability, Jan seemed to revel in his new celebrity. Other hackers now looked up to him. He won an award for his work, and a couple of years later, he'd win another. He made a jump few have ever achieved, from a skinny computer nerd to a bad boy vigilante. He wasn't apologizing for anything or trying to steer away from the story. At a New York City conference the summer after their home was raided, Jan and his father held a Q&A discussion in front of admiring fans. Watching video from their panel, you can tell how Jan feels about his situation. He doesn't try to deny his role in DCSS. If anything, he leans into it, cracking jokes and throwing insults at Hollywood and the U.S. judiciary system. When speaking of the making of DCSS, whether in his panel or to journalists, he always uses the pronoun we. From a legal perspective, that kind of language would make the next few years of his life rather complicated. I'll never forget his famous last words. He said, what are they going to do to me? When Hollywood's major movie studios caught wind of DCSS, they had a reason to be worried. There were already widely available tools online capable of converting large DVD files to video CD format, which would allow them to fit on a standard CD discs. Recordable DVD drives were set to hit the market the following year, meaning even that step wouldn't be necessary. All the while, DCSS source code was spreading rapidly among those with the power to use it. Dozens of hacker websites reposted the code. So the studios had two options. Build a better CSS or sue everybody. When it came out in 99, it was still a really, really early market. It was still early enough that if they had recalled all the keys, put out brand new keys for everybody, made sure that they were protected and encrypted, yeah, it would have hurt the early adopters, but they would have understood. Um, and I think that they could have gone forward from this because the market was so small. It's not like now. Um, they could, it, it, people would have taken a hit, I'm sure. I'm, you know, people may have needed you know, new firmware for their DVD players and software may have been broken and some old disks may have been uh, rendered useless. But it was still early enough to do something about it. And the industry didn't react quickly. Instead, instead of reacting you know, with a technological solution, they reacted with a legal solution. That never works. Hollywood movie studios began sending threatening letters to those who mirrored the DCSS code on their websites. Some caved, while others remained unfazed. Even more websites began mirroring DCSS in response to those threats, in defiance against those studios. In the following months, the DVD Copy Control Association, based in California, applied for a restraining order against any publication of the program, naming 72 websites as defendants. All the major movie studios, Disney, MGM, Paramount, TriStar, Universal, Columbia, and 20th Century Fox, joined together in a lawsuit against three individuals, Eric Corley, Sean Ray Merdes, and Roman Kazan, and their websites. Kazan, it turned out, was wrongly named in the suit. He was the owner of a web hosting service, not a DCSS mirroring website. Jon Johansson's trials in Norway, there were two of them, largely rested on his personal role in the development and proliferation of DCSS. A case against him in the state of California mattered little, as state courts had little jurisdiction over a teenager living in Norway. Even the orders placed against all those websites mattered relatively little in the larger scheme of things, because like a game of whack-a-mole, every website shut down over a DCSS mirroring might spawn one or two more in its stead. But the case brought by Hollywood's major studios was different. Commonly referred to as Universal vs. Ray Murders, the suit claimed that the defendants in republishing DCSS were in violation of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, 
written into U.S. law in October of 1998, which criminalized devices and services facilitating the circumvention of copyright controls. Shortly after the charges were first filed, Remerdes and Kazan entered into settlement and were soon dropped from the case. That left only Eric Corley and his popular publication 2600, The Hacker Quarterly, the sole defendant representing an entire underground hacking movement. Where the DVD Copy Control Association sought injunction against specific instances of websites they could find which published DCSS, Universal versus Remerdes took a broader approach. 2600 was merely propped up as an example of the broader precedent the studios wished to set. That anyone who has posted or will post DCSS or any similar copyright infringing software is in violation of U.S. law. Those in the hacking community knew that a win for the studios would have implications far past DCSS to all kinds of other online software distribution. The defense argued that code itself is a form of speech, not merely functional, but a means of human expression. Dr. David Turetsky, a professor from Carnegie Mellon University, was called to speak for the defense. In his testimony, Turetsky argued that no clear line can distinguish code from speech because code is simply human ideas written in computing language. All code, he pointed out, from JavaScript to binary, is readable by a human. A program like DCSS, described in English, written in C code, born out in mathematical functions, in zeros and ones, or in any other form, may appear different in presentation, but the underlying expression is equivalent across all forms. Therefore, because software represents human ideas and can be expressed in language, and because the type of code used to describe an idea doesn't change the fundamental idea itself, the code itself, no matter the form, is a form of speech. Backing up Turetsky's argument was an entire free and open source community rallied by Eric Corley and Jan Johansson that set up to prove the link between code and speech. A protest movement formed and programmers far and wide began using DCSS as a tool, finding any creative way to describe it in forms other than its own source code. There were Jeff Schrepfer and Mike Castleman's songs, the Star Wars movie, t-shirts and ties. Somebody wrote out the DCSS authorization code as a calligram for the DVD logo, and a high school student named Eric Michaels Uber used a portion of the authorization code as his yearbook quote. Evan Prodrumo, a software developer operating under the name Mr. Bad, wrote software for removing cascading style sheets, the ubiquitous programming language used for visual design from web pages. Removing cascading style sheets from the web is harmless, but it's about as useful as removing the paint from your house or your car. Prodrumo acknowledged its uselessness, but the trick was he got to name his program DCSS. He started distributing DCSS online and encouraged others to do the same. In one case, a school was made to remove DCSS from a student's web page, earning negative media attention when it was discovered to be that DCSS and not the real DCSS. Dave Turetsky himself, as part of the movement, wrote out a description of DCSS in plain English and posted a screenshot of its code as if to ask, does it count as speech if I describe it in words or use it in a picture? Someone else did a seven and a half minute dramatic reading of Derek Fawkes' authorization component as if to ask, does it count as art if I present it in dramatic form? Cypher Magi Productions present CSS underscore descramble dot C Written by Derek Fawkes Read by Zader Vartek Unsigned int LFSR1 underscore low comma LFSR1 underscore high pi 
left paren, salted, left paren, three, right paren, less than, less than nine, right paren, pipe, left paren, salted, left paren, two, right paren, Less than, less the most than famous right artwork right of the DCSS movement was written by a hacker named Seth Schoen. In 456 stanzas, all in 575 haiku form, Schoen weaved together a description of DCSS with commentary, artistic flourishes, and an invocation of the muse. Quote, now help me, Muse, for I wish to tell a piece of controversial math for which the lawyers of DVD-CCA don't forbear me to sue. That they alone should know or have the right to teach these skills and these rules. Do they understand the content or is it just the effects they see? And all mathematics is full of stories. Just read Eric Temple Bell. And CSS is no exception to this rule. Sing, muse, decryption once secret, as all knowledge once unknown, how to decrypt DVDs. End quote. Schoen's poem not only attracted the attention of major news outlets and research entities, it did the most to blur the line between where software ends and speech begins. Any hacker with skill and patience could extract DCSS from how to decrypt a DVD in haiku form. But did that mean the poem itself wasn't a just expression of free speech? It was a poem, useful, but also creative and multifaceted. Trying to pick out the code from the art would be rather difficult and trivial, and you'd probably look silly if you tried to do it. 5,400 words later, Schoen Poems ends with, quote, Have mercy on me, Lord, and lesser judges on Jan Johansson, end quote. Jan Johansson pleaded not guilty in 2002 under trial by Norwegian courts, arguing that he neither built the DCSS program itself, that was Nomad, nor used it to distribute pirated DVDs to others. If found guilty, he would face up to two years in prison. On January 7, 2003, Johansson was acquitted of all charges against him. An appeal was filed two weeks later, and after facing trial for a second time, Johansson was again acquitted on December 22 of the same year. Jan's no teenager anymore. He's 35 now. Despite the trouble he got into as a kid, he never turned away from reverse engineering and taking on major corporate interests. In 2004, he hacked Fair Play, a program which was to iTunes what CSS was to DVDs. In 2007, he was one of the first people to crack the original iPhone, allowing it to run Windows and circumvent Apple's exclusive partnership with AT&T at the time. Derek Focus, the only other person whose real name was associated with DCSS, was forced to ditch and cut all ties he had with the DCSS program. But he, too, avoided legal consequences of his work, since he neither published the original CSS authorization code online, he only rewrote it in C, nor he himself gave it to the masters of reverse engineering. They took it without asking first. In October 2000, an undercover U.S. customs operation began, designed to dismantle Drink or Die. Throughout 2001, James Cudney, known as Be Creative Online, rose up the ranks of DOD, all while logging conversations in chat rooms, collecting screen names and personal information on members of the group, and feeding it all to U.S. law enforcement. On December 11, 2001, a coordinated global raid commenced in the US, Canada, England, Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Australia, targeting 62 people in all. One of those 62 may or may not have been the easy. The group was ended for good. Universal vs. Ray Merdes was first brought on June 14, 2000, and the judge presiding over the case, Louis Kaplan of the Southern District of New York, instituted an injunction requiring that 2600 remove DCSS from their website 
while the case was ongoing. In an act of rebellion, Eric Corley and 2600 removed the program from their site, but posted links to other websites that offered DCSS for download. Despite the threats of legal action, as the case was proceeding, around 30 English-language websites either maintained live download links for DCSS or posted links to sites that did. In his final ruling, Kaplan found in favor of the plaintiff, concluding that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act advances a substantial government interest and is not a tool for wanton suppression of free speech. The MPAA won the case, and 2600, along with all other websites participating in the act, were ordered to take down DCSS and any links to any other websites hosting it. The legal precedent set by Judge Kaplan was strong in its affirmation of U.S. copyright authority, even if its effect on DCSS itself was not. Websites around the world, in the U.S., Europe, and as far as China, continued to post the program even years after being ordered to take it down. DCSS, in the end, had very little to do with watching movies. Even at its peak, it seems to have had little noticeable effect on the piracy market that existed long before and long after it. Did it hurt some sales? Probably. But, you know, the masses really weren't keen to how to download a DVD and then burn it. You know what I'm saying? It's not like this was something that anyone could do. You had to have a little bit of technical skill to, you know, use BitTorrent or whatever to to download the DVD and then burn it onto a blank ROM. Um, so it, I don't think it had the ability to have the massive effect that MP3 theft is having, for example. And Hollywood, you know, I, I never heard of a studio going under or a video store going under or anyone else going under because of DCSS. Um, maybe somebody can point to lost sales, but I really don't think that they were hurt all that badly by it, to be perfectly honest. More than anything, DCSS was a symbol of a movement. It came to stand for a group identity, a shared ideology for the promotion of free and open digital information against the large corporate and government interests who would seek to confine it. Do you, listener, feel akin to those hackers and their mission? That all digital expression should be without limit? Perhaps you feel the opposite, that those hackers misappropriated the sanctity of free speech as a ploy to try and legalize piracy and threaten an entire industry that only sought control over its own product. Either way, two decades later, it seems neither side really won what they were after. Movie sales have been challenged not so much by piracy, but by streaming services. We're now left with a question. If DCSS caused so many people so much trouble, incited a legal storm and an ideological war, what, in the end, was it really all for? Thank you for listening, and a special thanks to all the listeners who wrote to me in the past few weeks to say how much they love the show. Ryan, Tom from Sheffield, UK, Davis, Mike from Auckland, New Zealand, Der Perdensky, and the Cyber SWAT team from Madagascar. You rock, guys. Thank you so much. It's such a rush to know that we have people listening from all over the world. We live in truly amazing times. As always, you can find all of our past episodes on our website, malicious.life. You can mail and tweet me your ideas and feedback to ran, R-A-N, at ranlevy, R-A-N-L-E-V-I, dot com, and at ranlevy. Follow us on Twitter at at maliciouslife for updates on new episodes. Our first annual listeners survey is live on the website, malicious.life, with a special bonus episode for those who take it. Also, if you'd like to be a sponsor of our show, you can reach out to us via the Contact Us form in the website or via email at eliad at malicious.life. That's E-L-I-A-D 
at malicious.life. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. Thanks again to Cyber Reason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye. Oh my God. CK Music. Music. Music.